Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 384th New Social Environment. I'm Anya Bernstein, an events assistant at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Helen Lee, Joaquin, Joaquin Pizarro, and Adam Weinberg. We're thrilled to have the poet and Rail team member Ty Cooper here, who will read to close today's program. Just a few quick notes before we get started. The Rail team will be helping out with tech if you have any questions and closed captions are available by pressing the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen. We've started all of our events with two very important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on the Napehoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Mansi, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom in recognition, recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation, to borrow words from Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you to check out the chat for a living document of resources. And I'm gonna just post it right here. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts. Curator and museum director, Adam D. Weinberg became the Alice Pratt Brown director of the Whitney Museum in 2003. During his tenure, the Whitney has presented dozens of exhibitions on emerging, mid-career and established artists, offered award-winning educational programs, dramatically expanded its performance program and experienced exponential growth in the permanent collection. Under his leadership, the museum opened its new 220,000 square foot Renzo Piano Design Building in 2015 in the Meatpacking District. From 1999 to 2003, Weinberg served as the director of the Addison Gallery of American Art at Phillips Academy Andover. Prior to that, he was director of education and assistant curator at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Collector, academic, art advisor, art book editor, and auction house specialist, Helen Lee has worked at Christie's, Aaron and Abrams Publishing, the Robert Miller Gallery, and for James Wolfinson, among others. Helen is an advisor to the Milken Institute for its arts and culture programming. She is the chairman of the American Foundation for the Courtauld Institute of Art, where she completed her postgraduate studies. Helen is a board member of the Brooklyn Rail. Art historian Joaquin Pizarro is the Burchard Professor of Art History and Director of the Hunter College Galleries, Hunter College, City University of New York. He was a curator at MoMA's Department of Painting and Sculpture. His latest book, Aesthetics of the Margins, The Margins of, the Margins of Aesthetics, Wild Art Explained, 2018, is co-authored with David Carrier. Joaquin is consulting editor of The Rail. So without further ado, uh, please take it away. It's great to see everyone. Um, and thank you all for being here. As Anya mentioned, this is our 384th new social environment conversation. Uh, two days after 9-11, post Labor Day, it seems like the perfect time to welcome you, Adam, as our special guest today. How are you doing? Um, are you getting ready? Are you ready for the exciting fall season? We have pretty much just started already. Um, how's, how are things going over there? Well, it was really nice. I'm, I'm, first of all, I want to say um, thank you to the Brooklyn Rail. I'm a great admirer of all of yours and Bong, um, um, great leader. And um, thank you all for joining today. I see the names of many old friends on, on screen. Um, uh, I was here on Friday night. We have um, our um, Pay What You Wish admission on Friday night. And um, it was wonderful to see a line that went all the way around the corner. And um, and I have to say it was mostly young people online, which is always a good sign. Um, uh, but the energy was really, really palpable. And um, you know, it's been a long year for all of us. But I, you know, this is um, this we've been open now for over a year. We opened last August, and I feel that it's been um, museums have served a really important community function in the past year. I think um, maybe more than ever because theaters and dance and movies and all, so many other kind of cultural events weren't able to happen during the, uh, this past COVID year, but museums have been um, um, open for the greater part of it. And so um, 
as a gathering place, as a community place, and to be able to do so safely is a, is a wonderful thing. And um, and so that so you know um, we've 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 delayed many things. We did not cancel a single um, um, exhibition. Um, we had to move things ahead, uh, like our Jasper John show, which is opening a year late, and the Biennial, which is opening a year late. But um, but we we're, we're forging ahead, and we um, um, uh, it means a lot for us to be able to be here for the community, the community of artists, but the community of people who um, want to be inspired by art. No, it's been uh, really exciting for us audience members and visitors that you're open and doing such an amazing job presenting all that you have um, going for, for the permanent collection and the shows you've been putting on. Well, and I'm just thinking that we're not completely out of the woods yet. And I'm wondering in your opinion, what are some of the lessons we might have learned during this past year that will continue or what are some of the um, programming ideas or things that you think might stick as we move on slowly but surely out of this particular period towards something less restrictive? I mean, there are two things that, um, I mean, for me, one is, I mean, I'm a very much of a people person and I like to be in person and I think, and you know, when you work in a museum, it's really about um, being with real objects is your, is your, is your hope. I mean, there's, you know, it's one thing to, you know, to be looking at reproductions. It's another thing to be looking at things on a shiny slick screen, but um, there's nothing like looking at the actual um, uh, uh, things up close. And um, uh, so I so I think that, you know, that, that in-person presence is really critical, um, but at the same token, what we've learned is that, um, is that through Zoom, you can connect to a larger national and international community in a way that we've never been able to before. And so what we've tried to do is figure out those hybrid circumstances and certain kinds of um, programs where it's harder for whether it's accessibility or distance reasons and how to use um, uh, use a computer to connect people to the institution and not use it to replace the in-person experience, but to augment and to, um, and, uh, to extend uh, the in-person experience. And, and um, we had a lot to learn very quickly. We had to make it up very fast. I'm really um, proud of the Whitney staff. Um, we're learning what works and what doesn't work and what people like and what they don't like. And, um, you know, they are you know, I think some of our after school programs for kids use studio classes and so surprised work incredibly well. Um, sometimes there's some, you know, lectures and talks which you think would work really well and just don't. Um, so it, it, it's very variable. So that's one. Um, uh, the other thing that uh, has happened in the last year is the connection between um, uh, the art museums. Um, the art museums have been working collectively um, and it started first with um, particularly the health protocols, but it had to do with a whole lot of other things, whether it was um, equity and inclusion issues, et cetera. I have never seen the arts museums directors, and it's also not only the art museums, but some of the other museums as well, working as collaboratively as they have in the past year. And I'm now entering, I think it's my 19th year as the director of the Whitney. And um, I've always had wonderful relationships and admire so many of my colleagues, but um, the, the opportunity to be able to work um, with both smaller and larger art museums and to hear things from different perspectives and, you know, um, you know, and, um, you know, we directors have been beaten up a lot in the last few years and it's not easy. We have to be all things to all people. And I have to say, we've provided a wonderful support network and therapy session for each other too, which has been really a pleasant, a pleasant surprise. You know, there's that sort of knowing look, even if you don't agree with people on one thing or another, that's the knowing look that we're, that we're, you know, we're sharing an experience together. We're all on the bus together. So that's been a really that sounds surprise. That sounds really productive and important. Um, I think um, there have been a couple of groups that I've heard about where uh, you've shared these different bits of information and collaborative efforts, and they all seem incredibly uh, collegial and uh, collaborative, just as you said. Um, so I'm glad also that you're talking about highlights because there are so many challenges that museums and museum leaders and institutions are facing now. But I really do think there are some highlights and important um, that we've not only met challenges, but as we're moving forward, that things are improving. Uh, you mentioned education, uh, especially for younger uh, students. 
Um, what are some other things, maybe even not at the Whitney, but with your collaborative team and other museums that you think are, are positive results of, of how you've been working recently in the past year or so? Well, I think, you know, I think that, you know, for me, I, I, what I've really enjoyed are the kind of, um, of the more intimate talks, the kind of one-on-one -on -one talks, um, the interviews. I think those, you know, where you bring in an expert or two or somebody who's just published a book or a small group of artists. I think the feeling, you know, it's strange because here Zoom is in a funny way, one of the most impersonal things, but yet when you, I think when you have something that really feels like a more intimate kind of a book talk or conversation about works or conversation with artists, I mean, um, um, and it was great. There was one point where I did an, you know, and I, um, I it was a, a three-way interview. It was in the, with an, an artist in um, uh, Marfa, Texas, an artist in Korea, and um, and and an author in New York. And um, uh, you know, and to be able to come together for one hour to talk and actually um, uh, four people who didn't even know each other that well. It was really, I think, very very successful. So. I think again, where the where you can where you can use Zoom to create an intimacy, um, even if it's a kind of um, uh, virtual intimacy. I think that's where it's most successful, as opposed to the kind of blah 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 of endless lectures and and, and words where you just sort of drone out, and that um, makes you even less want to be on screen. <laughs> I totally agree from a personal level, seeing the talks with artists that I admire and ones that I don't know very well has been an incredible uh, part of this time. And um, also uh, the point that you make that it can bring people together from all over the world in a much simpler way than we used to have to do things. Um, so that's definitely been a positive too. Um, before we move on to some more uh, historical things and uh, some pictures, which we have plenty of, um, I just wanted to ask you before, uh, and we'll talk about this more, I think, throughout, but um, I think for some of the obvious reasons, the metrics for success of what makes a museum work or what the purpose or the mission of a museum is, has changed somewhat. It still is attendance and great shows and things, but do you think there are new ways that we can look at museums and what they're doing and how they're contributing to our communities and, and give examples of, of what you've seen as being some positive ways in which we're now moving away from just the blockbuster or the high attendance yeah, shows mean, to something of a bigger picture? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the you know, the attendance for all institutions have been, you know, been obviously considerably down. Um, uh, but you know, for, for me, there's always been, it's the qualitative um, and, and, and those things are really, really hard to measure. Um, although now you, you, know, you have all the different marketing tools and everything in the comments and everything. But you know, I, I, you know, for me, a lot of where I really moved is like, for example, we, um, we have an, an, um, a, a wonderful teen program that's been going on for 30 years called Youth Insights. And when I, you know, the, and, and particularly teens have been, um, you know, isolated and not in school and all of that. And, um, you know, and to hear some of their comments about what they've gotten out of um, our program, our online program, and to feel connected to other teens who are going through the same kinds of things and, um, you know, and about their art making and that type of thing. It's, you know, it's, 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 the, it, it's the comments that you hear about people. I remember the first day we opened up and, in August, um, uh, after we had been closed for six months, and and you know the, the, this woman walked in the door and she was absolutely you know she you know she was actually weeping and she said you know I've had the most awful year my husband died and and you know and 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 she just said you know she said you know to be here and to be in the space you know it, it's it's something it's it, it I, I didn't realize how much it meant to me it's it's those it's those little kinds of comments that are really big that you know make you know, those are the kinds of things that most, you know, make me feel that, um, you know, we're, you know, um, we're making a difference in some way, you know, and that, 
and you know, artists have been around a lot and people, you know, and, and I'm, I'm around, I've been at the museum, I'd say about 80% of the time, even though I'm on Zoom in my office, I am physically in the museum about 80% of the time. And um, I'm often in the galleries and, you know, sometimes there's three people in the galleries, but they're looking and enjoying it, you know, and other times it's more crowded and people are feeling a little bit more cautious, but, um, you know, you take an awful lot for granted in this time. And I think that people are really reevaluating and rethinking. And I think, you know, what art teaches us is that we're always reevaluating and, and thinking. I mean, I see Judith Bernstein, for example, an artist friend who's on there and it's like, you know, you know, great artists help us to constantly reevaluate ourselves and reevaluate what we're doing and what we're thinking about. And I think the great thing about art is it teaches us to be agile, flexible, responsive. And, you know, that's what um, a place like the Whitney can be about. Perfect. And perfect segue, I think, to start talking about the Whitney and a little bit about the history. So we're going to start the slides. And I just wanted to point out, Adam, I was truly impressed by your long history. It doesn't seem possible that on and off throughout the years, you've been associated with the Whitney for 30 years. Is that right? Close to it. Close to it. So I don't know the exact amount of time and I'm not much of a counter, so I don't know. But, um, uh, you know, that's my third time at the Whitney. I, you know, I say I'm either like Haley's Comet, I just keep coming back or a bad penny that you can't get rid of. But, um, um, you know, but and also practice makes perfect, you know, all of the cliches. But um, the first time I worked at the Whitney, I um, was the director at the Equitable Center at Whitney when um, uh, the director was Tom Armstrong. Um, and, you know, and um, it was, it was, it was great to be part of what was um, known as the Whitney Branch Museums at the height of that period. There were four branch museums around New York and one in Connecticut. And the idea was about getting, if you couldn't have a bigger building, how do you get art out into the community? And that was, you know, a, a great experience for me. Um, uh, I had worked in education. My background had been museum education. Um, I still believe, um, above all, my role is as an educator in museums. And um, it was great being at a branch museum because I was connected to a neighborhood and a community and the schools in that neighborhood. Um, um, and actually that's not the particular branch, but that was the Whitney at Philip Morris branch at the time. And, um, and uh, at the same time, I was part of a much larger institution. And um, so the good thing was, I had to um, know a certain amount about how to run a run a group and, and do exhibitions and programs, um, but the ultimate financial responsibility was not mine, which was really lovely. Um, so I did that for a little while. I left the institution, went and worked in Paris for a little while at the American Center in Paris, which was also a great learning experience and learned as much by um, the successes as well as the failures of that institution. You know, often one learns more from the things that don't work than the things that do work. I came back to the Whitney under then director David Ross, who was um, um, a great spirit with great energy, um, great passion for artists, and I think opened up the Whitney Museum in a way that had never been opened before. If you think of the, um, you know, the famous infamous 1993 biennial, you think of Thelma Golden's Great Black Male Show. Those are some of the many kinds of shows, the great Bob Thompson show. Uh, so many great exhibitions that happened at that time. Um, uh, and, you know, the great Keith Haring show that Elizabeth uh, Sussman did, um, who was a curator here still today. Um, that was a great time. I then left the Whitney and went to the Addison Gallery of American Art up at Andover and had another small intimate experience. I feel like my, my career has been made up of larger and smaller experiences than mm -hmm. um, the Addison Gallery, which has one of the great collections of American art, but it's a small place. And um, I remember when I left that institution, I said I will probably never have a, a better job than the job that I had at the Addison Gallery because that in a small teaching museum, you write, you teach, you, um, you curate, um, you have a closeness to the work and you're not as worried about the fundraising and the marketing and the political stuff and the communications in the same way. But I can say coming to the Whitney, I've never had a more exciting, challenging and growing job that I've had in the last um, 18 years at the Whitney. So, and um, um, Maybe been... we can show some images of the Whitney that many of us no, remember. I remember the Equitable, but maybe we can show the Met Yeah, you could show some of the, um, 
Yes, this was uh, the first biennial that um, uh, happened when I came back to the Whitney in 2003. And um, as you pointed out, Helen, it's called Bound to Fail, this piece by Paul McCarthy. And I love the idea because two things. One is, um, if you take risks, and we really believe in taking risks of the Whitney, it means sometimes you're going to fail. That's the nature of it. And I love that um, uh, that Paul put that up there. It was an inflatable sculpture. But um, I also like, too, because it really um, symbolized the fact that how small the Breuer building was and that the only way that we could really do everything we needed to, and I think for you know those of you who knew the Breuer building well, um, we used every hallway, every possible space in the building in front of the space, on the space. You know, we had Trisha Brown doing performances, walking down the walls of the outside of the building. We did projections on the building. We did installations on the sidewalk. We did things in Central Park. We did things with the armory. Um, it was about how do you explode and expand the institution? And actually, you have the next one, which I think is great. And, and yes, that the great Lawrence Wiener show that um, Donna DeSalvo, who was our chief curator, did. I always thought to me this was um, very much a great metaphor for um, uh, the institution, the limits of institutions, the limits of buildings, um, and possibilities of art and the possibilities of institutions. And uh, this was um, Lawrence's um, outdoor piece. Um, um, I just, just want to make sure, jo Joachim, your um, thoughts about seeing these works yeah. from Nick, you no, it's, prior. I see it uh, with great nostalgia of having seen everything, and it's really fascinating to hear um, Adam uh, Bemuse. I'm, I'm so taken by everything I hear, but I'm actually, I see uh, somebody in the, in the screen who's asking, how do you explode and expand a, an institution? And I'm sure that's exactly where Adam is about to go now telling us about the passage from uh, from the Breuer building yeah. to the Renzo Piano building. Well, um, I, I have a segue question. I, maybe you want to initiate, to start with this, uh, Adam. Um, looking at the great images that the, our audience is going to see in a second, I was struck for the very first time by, by the kinships, by the similitude between the structures of the Breuer and the Renzo Piano building. I, I wanted to, if you could expand on that. and. If there was a um, deliberate um, dialogue with Renzo to emulate Roy, I mean, I don't know what you're saying exactly, but is there a connection of sort between well, you the know, two? You know, it's interesting. Somebody said to me when we opened the building, when we were about to open the building downtown, how do you know that you've succeeded in the, in, in the downtown building? And I said, if somebody comes to me and says, it feels like the Whitney Museum, then I huh. will know we succeeded. Because I didn't, you know, I, 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 always, I love the Breuer building and I worked in it for many, many years, know every square inch of the building. It's a brilliant building. Breuer did an incredible job. It was built though for the art of the 1950s, 60s and 70s um, and not beyond. And the collection had grown like 10 times from what it was. And, um, but we maxed out that building in every possible way. And, um, uh, um, you know, and but when we went downtown, you know, Renzo was, um, um, uh, um, you know, knew the Breuer building because we actually, we did a, what I call a practice run. We tried to expand, some of you will remember, we tried to expand the Breuer building on the Upper East Side, spent three years in landmarks and zoning trying to do it. And then in the end, we determined that we weren't able to um, expand on that site in a way that really would do the Breuer building justice, but would most importantly do the Whitney justice. And so we chose to move downtown, was reluctant at the time. Um, and, and, and it was really challenging because the, um, the High Line was not open at that time. And the, uh, and, and the neighborhood was actually a lot like um, this. I mean, it was getting a little, yeah. little bit nicer. It was a little bit earlier, but not much actually. It was in the 1990s. And, um, um, and um, but Renzo really, you know, he, we, you know, he asked us for, you know, I remember in one exercise, he asked us for words to describe um, uh, uh, the Whitney in different um, ways of thinking about it. And, you know, intimacy was an important thing that no matter how large that the institution would be physically. We wanted a sense of intimacy. We wanted a sense of, of, um, of, of connection. And the other thing is, you know, Renzo always said, you know, I love the Breuer building. It's a great building, but it's not exactly a joyous building. And I think that that's right. I mean, I think what you see in the new building is that it has a sense of joy and uplift, 
but it's also a, what I call a 360 degree building, which you see very much in this shot, is that you look out in all directions um, and, um, and you are seen from all directions. And to me, it's a metaphor for, um, uh, for connection to the community. It's a metaphor for connection to the world. And the transparency was not just about having great views, but it was about revealing what people would see, not making mystery. I mean, remember the Breuer building was really a fortress. It's a great fortress and we tried everything to do. And somebody said, what, what do you mean explode the building? Explode the building in the sense that make it not a mystery. For imagine for people who, you know, the Upper East Side was not a place that you felt comfortable with. Um, uh, if you were, you know, you know, maybe, um, you know, a person who was not um, uh, from the Upper East Side, imagine not knowing what is in the building, you're going across the moat. I mean, dramatic building, but this is a building where you actually see that it's about art. You can see it on the outside, you can see it through the building. And um, I like that, in fact, I mean, I remember at the time, and I think it was Michael Kimmelman who wrote a review, is, you know, he was sort of asking, like, you know, what is, you know, what is the, you know, the, the, the iconic shot of the building, which, you know, where, and, you know, this building was designed in 360 degrees. The, you know, the, every side is a front, every side is a back, you know, every side. And I, I love that you see the art from above, you see it from below. And really to me, it is, it's a metaphor for the perspectives of art. And I'll, I'll never forget when Renzo said to me, um, I, and I said, we wanted a lot of outdoor space and outdoor galleries, and I thought he would put them facing the Hudson River. And I said to Renzo, I said, and when, when he showed this to me, that it was kind of facing the high line in the city, Renzo, he took me to the West Side Highway and he looked over, and this is a great shot that gives you a sense. You can't tell where the building ends and the high line in the neighborhood. And he said, you know, you're not going to be, you know, this is, you would be turning your back to the neighborhood. And if you were um, having your terraces on the other way, it, the Whitney Museum you said is about connection. It's about community. It's about intimacy. Make this building part of the neighborhood, make it part. Don't turn your back on the community. And he was right. And he said, you'll get the views. You won't have the noise of the West Side Highway and you can create a built, great building. And, but you know, and, and, and it brings to mind also another story, if you'll forgive me for a second, just to kind of, is, is that I remember in 2007, Flora Biddle, who is the granddaughter of Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, we were at a, at a luncheon at, at um, artist Pat, Pat Steer's home. And I remember afterwards I said, Flora, um, uh, may I give you a, a, a ride home? And then I said, why don't I take you to what I believe will be the new site of the Whitney? And this was in midwinter. And I think it was around 2006, 2007. It was pretty early on. It was before the opening of the High Line. And I realized to myself, as I was driving through the, driving through the meatpacking district, it looked a lot like that photograph that you saw. It was sort of abandoned, it was cold, there was garbage in the streets. And I was thinking, this is not the day you want to take um, the granddaughter of Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney through the meatpacking district <laughs> to show her a future home. But Flora is a great visionary and an open-minded person and somebody who loves art and artists. And I said, you know, this is where the new building is going to be. I know it doesn't look like much, but I think someday this, this will be really extraordinary. And she said to me, and she turned, and I never forgot. She said, Adam, the Whitney Museum is not a building. It's an idea. Wherever you think the Whitney needs to be to realize that idea is where the Whitney Museum should be. And I thought to myself, this is the woman who was the chairman of the board, president of the board when the Breuer building was built. The money was built with, with her mother's money. This is the building that she and her, and her, former, and her former husband who was a, por, a partner of, of Marcel Breuer's. And yet she was willing to say, it's okay to leave this building that many people thought of as the Whitney's ancestral home, which it wasn't because there were two previous locations and would move to another neighborhood. To me, that is the spirit of the Whitney Museum. Amazing story, really amazing, isn't it, Helen? I agree, and I just wanted to point out, maybe this is the right time. I was really impressed by the idea that uh, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney started the Whitney. Um, because not exactly in protest, but in opposition or challenge to her collection being rejected by the MoMA. So it by started Met, small. Oh, sorry, by the Met, even, <laughs> even worse. Okay, okay. so, um, and uh, it, well, was, it, it was meant to be small and uh, off the commercial grid, 
Um, and she herself was an artist. And I loved that not only was she a woman taking that stand, but the first director, Juliana Force, I remember that name because I, I love it, uh, was the first director. So it goes hand in hand with your uh, story about all of these Absolutely. women taking a role in, in starting this amazing institution. And, and, Gert, so, and, Gert, and most of, most museums are founded by collectors, not by artists. And um, and you know, and and, she, and 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 Gertrude actually never intended to create a museum. She wanted to go back to making her art, which is why she offered her collection to the Met. And she was going to give them a gift of two million dollars for an American wing, which was a fortune. This was right before. Um, actually, it was right during the Depression. And she never even and she never even had a chance to uh, tender her offer for the two million dollars. The director at the time said, "We have enough of that um, garbage in our basement, basically." And, and <laughs> don't mention Juliana the director. Forrest, we won't said, mention his name. <laughs> we would, nobody That's will remember it. <laughs> um, so, I just out of curiosity, I'm just wondering during your early days or even now, other than the Whitney. Are there any other museums that you particularly are, are special to you that you enjoy touch points or places that give you a perspective um, you since know, you have been at the Whitney for a while? You know, there are, are um, you know, there's some, you're, you're talking about the buildings now or you're talking about institutions broad, broadly? All, anyway. all of the above. All of the above. I mean, you know, like, like, Anybody who loves museums, and particularly any museum staff member, you know, I'm, I know the world through museums. Like when I go to visit cities, I can tell you more about the museums than I can about any place, any, anything else in any country or any culture. And I have so many favorite ones for so many different reasons. Um, uh, you know, I love the Louisiana Museum in, Den in Denmark because I love its, um, its, its lack of um, pretension um and it's 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 connection to the land um i love the pompidou center which was renzo's what he calls it his folly which he did with richard richard rogers um because it really is a community center as much as it is a museum and its flexibility um there you know there's so you know there's so you know so many great museums historical and contemporary and i love different things about different 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 um different ones you know Okay. Going on, so I was just wondering, can, can I ask a question about your, your profile? You, you've been, uh, um, and you, you gave us the, the list of uh, the impressive institutions you have been in, uh, Adam, and I forgot about your stay in, um, in the Gary building in Paris. That's, uh, that's interesting, another major architectural sig signature, but they all have one common denominator, if I may say so, they, whether it's the Edison, the Whitney, um, the American Museum of Paris, uh, they focus single single hand. I mean, on American art. You probably are one of the great specialists yourself of American art at large. And I wondered whether you might want to expand on the model that um, Whitney, the Whitney created, and became a, a center of focus of references. Even of late, you think about Crystal Bridges in Arkansas. You think about uh, the Dallas Museum that became at some point called the Museum of the Americas, etc. Always looking back at what the Whitney did uh, early in 1930. It's a completely new invention, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I mean, when Mrs. Whitney created the museum, there, there were very few galleries, um, um, period, in, in New York, but um, very few that were showing American art. And, you know, the reason she did it is I think she felt very much rejected both as an artist and as a woman. And she felt, you know, that it, you know that any great any any great country really had to have a cultural life, and that meant not just the museums, but the, you know, but 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 um, uh, art schools and publications, etc. And she supported all of those, and um, and you know, because up until that time, most artists who were considered serious artists had to go to Paris, had to go to London, had to go to Germany in order to be, you know, considered serious artists. And the idea was. Why couldn't it happen here? Now you know it's a, it's it's a very different world, but you know the, and the museum has gone through various um, metamorphoses over 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 the years as perceptions about American art. And I remember when you know when I came when I became as director in two thousand and three, 
Um, I remember one longtime board member said, maybe we should drop the American from Whitney Museum of American Art. It's all about contemporary. The art world is global. We should be thinking about you know, America and, and the globe. And in fact, it was that moment where everybody was thinking about things globally. And it was, you know, and actually a common um, criticism of the Whitney um, uh, just before um, and around the time that I arrived was the, was the Whitney relevant anymore? And it was kind of a, a, a constant um, um, chant in the press, you know, the Whitney was irrelevant. And I think it's because the world was seen then as a global and that, you know, the Whitney, something that was focusing just on itself was seen as being um, parochial. Um, but you know, what's, you know, what's really interesting is, you know, in, in, in the past 20 years, I think what we, what we realize um, so much is that, you know, there's America is the world, you know, New York itself has, uh, has a population um, that, you know, where there's over 300 languages spoken in the city of New York. I mean, we live in a country um, that is, is a country of, of many cultures. There is so much um, uh, uh, to um, connect with and appreciate in, in American art and its full diversity that the Whitney has barely scratched the surface of in many ways. And, you know, and I think we've been, you know, and actually our America is hard to see, which was the opening show of, of the Whitney um, was a show that we, you know, really tried to suggest um, uh, the, the great breadth of, of different cultures and different ways of seeing that um, added to American art. And the phrase, which originally comes from uh, the author E.B. White, America's Hard to See, and that is no matter how hard you try, no matter how often you do exhibitions about America and American arts, you'll never get it in focus. It's constantly shifting and changing. And that um, is a real challenge to us. And, you know, that's why, you know, the biennial, um, continues to be relevant and continues to be interesting, continues to be challenging, it continues to be beat up as an, as an exhibition because it will always be imperfect. It will always um, be a partial view of things. And um, I think that um, our chief curator, deputy director, Scott Rothkopf and the many curators of the Whitney, whether it's the 2019 biennial um, or the 22 that's going to be opening um, uh, soon, um, you know, the, um, you know, I, we have, we have done so much in, you know, not in recent years in particular with, you know, with, with indigenous artists, with, uh, Latinx artists. Um, we have a really strong record of working with black artists, which we, which goes way back and, um, and we can always do better we can always do more, but it's something that is, you know, I think goes in the DNA of the institution, uh, way back. Um, uh, you know, we, Whitney didn't get religion when Black Lives Matter happened, you know, it reinforced a commitment that we've always deeply felt. And I, you know, I got to give David Ross and Thelma Golden a great shout out. Um, and even there, you know, Marsha Tucker, who was the founder of the new museum, started her job as a curator at the Whitney, and she was a great mm -hmm. voice for diversity, as was a wonderful curator named James Monty, who did. Um, so there, there is a history of, uh, of that, and how do we expand on that history? You know, for the longest yeah. time, American art up until the 1970s was this question of what was American about American art, a very essentialist kind of a question. And I always called it the artichoke, the artichoke view, that if you peeled away the leaves, you eventually get to pure American. And what people didn't realize was the fact that, you know, American was all the leaves, that the heart of the heart of it is only is uh, only one piece of it. And, um, and, you know, here's a great piece by Kara Walker, who, um, you know, we presented her retrospective. She's an artist who's shown here a lot, you know, for many years. Um, and um, I love this was a project that we did out in, out in the streets. This was something that was originally commissioned. And this was a conjunction with the Jason Moran show done by Adrian Edwards, one of the co-curators of the Biennial. Um, spe spectacular exhibition. I uh, yeah, also wanted to see if we could get a shot of early, early works, um, early shows from Kara Walker and others from the Breuer too. There's one, that, yeah, terrific. This is the Kara Walker show in 27, uh, 2007 that um, was organized by the Walker Art Center and then came here, which were, which was a fantastic show. Mm -hmm. Big Absolutely. survey of 200 works from her mm -hmm. show. One thing that I also found very interesting um, is how, over the time, over time, the history of the Whitney did change their sort of definition of what it meant to be an American artist. I think initially, it was you needed a green card or a 
U.S. citizenship or something to become yeah, different, American? Different, yeah, different directors have interpreted it differently. When um, Tom, but Arms, now, now we interpret anybody who is who is working in the U.S. who is you know somehow kind of doing something substantial that contributes to how we think about um, 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 uh, this country or an American artist living abroad. It could be that way, but we're, we have to, we feel that you know we have to be flexible. The definition has to be flexible and fluid and. Um, and um, you know, to you know, the idea that it, that a citizen that a citizen or green card is defining is really a, a kind of more legalistic um, reason of doing so. Yeah. Well, I think a perfect and show love... expands on what you're saying, uh, Adam. Is um, Americana Vida, which uh, I know we have an, an image of it coming up, and that's. I, I, I wondered whether you might want to comment on this, on the notion of America as in plural, as the fact that there are more than one America. You know. Except Vida Americana. Yeah. I mean, you know, was we are, no, I mean, this was a wonderful show organized by Barbara Haskell and um, Marcella Guerrero. Um, um, and, um, and, you know, this exhibition looked at the, you know, the south to north influences, you know, so typically, um, you know, people look at, you know, the history of modernism is coming from, um, uh, um, east to west, um, you know, from Europe to the United States. But um, this was a show that I would say, you know, the, the fundamental premise was the idea that so many of the artists um, uh, in the early part of the century had a great influence on what um, American art became in the next century, whether, you know, whether it was Sequeiros um, or Rivera, that, you know, the, the, the social um, importance of art, the social impact of art. And, you know, what people said to me, having seen the Vita Americana show is, you know, did you time it for this moment that the show is up? And in fact, no, this was a show that had been organized five years before, but the relevance of it and the questioning of what America is and, um, and, and, and the role of immigrants, the role of immigrants from, um, um, from Mexico in particular, and what that, what that meant. And, um, you know, so this was a show that, you know, raised those kinds of questions and showed the extraordinary influence of, of as I said, South to North. Also, it was, uh, it just brings to point that you don't, that Whitney doesn't shy away from having political shows. This was a highly politicized, uh, lots of politicized subject matter that um, isn't always addressed. And I thought that was very interesting too, well, that there was I, that history throughout. Well, you know, I think you know, that's, it's, it's a question, you know, I, I mean, here's a perfect example of a show that was organized by um, several of our curators, I think, and David Breslin and, uh, and Rue Hockley were, you know, two, I think there might have been one other, forgive me, whoever I'm forgetting right now, but, um, um, but this exhibition actually looked at, this is a collection exhibition of, of protests um, not just protest in art and what that means and not just actually social realist work or, or work that's even figurative, but also the notion of abstract work as protest, but it also looked at many protests against the Whitney itself. We had a long section of documentation of protest let letters written, uh, written by um, uh, 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 protesters, the um, Black Coalition against the Whitney, the realists against the Whitney, the abstractionists against the Whitney, you know, I mean, um, and you know, um, you know, uh, you know, not that we ever court protest, and we don't. I mean, and it's not always fun, as we know. But but the point is that, um, uh, you know, that it, it is sort of the birthright of the institution. I mean, the protests go back to the early founding of the institution, even, even Mrs. Whitney's days. There were many protests against the um, museum for one thing or another. And I think that when you're about the art of your day, the art of your of the present. You know, you're going to be involved um, indirectly, and in you know, we're you know, we are not, you know, we don't take political sides. We can't. I mean, you know, our tax exempt status would be would be in question. But, but you you can't but not be involved with um, you know the the issues of the day. That is part of what um, artists are about. Artists are always involved in social causes in one way or another. So whether it's you know whether it's you know Philip Guston as we know and you know or or, um, or, or, you know, or, or, or Jacob Lawrence, whoever it is, there's always, you know, political, political questions that are going to come up one way or another. And you can't, you know, you have to embrace what that is. Um, 
as I said, not always easy, not, um, but. Um, um, you know, Before we move on to, to a continuation of this uh, subject matter with uh, Julie Meretu and um, David Hammonds, uh, I just wanted to, I thought that it was really interesting to, to learn about Siqueiros, who I didn't know very much about. I didn't know very much about it, many of those artists, you know but that when he was exiled, uh, he mentored artists like Jackson Pollock exactly. and Philip Gustin. They were doing, which I yes, found they, fascinating. In, Union, in Union Square, no less. I mean, you know, <laughs> it was the middle of Union activities and Siqueiros was, um, you know, had tremendous influence on Pollock and New Pollock, and they did, you know, um, kind of um, public um, performative events and things like that. And I, you know, I think Sikeros in particular really changed uh, the direction of American art tremendously. And one, so, one other, sorry, what just to compliment, I mean, so complimenting what, what you're saying, Helen, uh, there is, a, uh, I was very surprised, um, but surprised, but not surprised to find out the connections between Siqueiros, Rivera, I mean, the whole group and the USSR at the time. And, um, and I don't know if you, if you knew, but in fact, Barbara and I were invited to talk um, with a, on the Zoom uh, webinar with the, with the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. And we found out that there is not one, but you know, half a dozen current PhD theses in Russia right now, reinvestigating the history of America through the Mexican uh, impact of the muralists and their political legacy on the USSR. Fascinating uh, topic, you know. I didn't, I wasn't aware of that. It does not surprise me, um, but I wasn't aware of that particular thing. So thank you. Mm. I just, I'm glad we're mentioning Barbara Haskell as well, because I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of hers, but as are many people, I'm sure, but just um, her long history at the Whitney as well, which is, um, uh, an interesting one. Um, we, have, we have, you know, it's great. We have, um, you know, uh, Barbara, um, who's uh, probably, the, I think, is the longest serving curator. We have Elizabeth Sussman, who has served for many, many years here. We have, and, and we have wonderful young and new curators um, uh, here. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, I think what's, what's great is that you have people from different, both generational perspectives, different cultural perspectives, different gender perspectives, um, looking at American art. And, um, and I'll tell you, our curatorial meetings are much a, a table of debate as they are of agreement. I mean, in, in the end, we, we, you know, we find enough consensus, but, you know, um, American art is not one one thing it's many multiple things and we should have many voices from within doing that um and and uh, i think that um again scott rothkoff our chief Dep curator deputy director has assembled a, a great range of talents of you know david breslin and adrian edwards who are doing the biennial and lou hockley and marcella guerrero and i mean and you know it's, and, and jane panetta i mean great really really extraordinary extraordinary people i mean we have um uh uh, uh, Laura is doing uh, is doing a Jean Quick to See Smith show. This will be the first retrospective of, um, um, that actually the Whitney is um, originated of a living Indigenous artist, which is kind of shocking. Even though we've shown and we've collected some work by Indigenous artists, we did the Jimmy Durham show, which we took from the Hammer. But you know, this is something we have been behind on, and we are re really rethinking that. And, you know, we, we acknowledge our, our, our gaps and we try to move forward and to, and to try to do better on the ones that we haven't. So we're going to move on to collaborations and uh, Julie Maretu and David Hammonds and what's coming up next. But one small thing that I think is not small is the changes you've made in the wall, um, wall hang, the descriptions in putting in the uh, where these artists are from. Um, and where they may have died. And I think that that's sort of a very significant Absolutely. move that I haven't seen and anywhere you know, else. And you know, all those, all those things that seem like little things that in fact, I'm impressed that, that uh, you noticed that Helen. So thank you for um, bringing it, you know, but you know, every way that you acknowledge inclusion is a way of, of making people feel part of something. And, and, I, and, I, and I think it, it, you know, it's really critical that when people come to the Whitney that they feel that they can see themselves broadly speaking within this institution, the works we collect, the shows that we do. Um, and, 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 it, and, it's, and, it, and it's not, and it's not about you know, having one of everything or, but it's it, understanding that there are many different ways 
that artists think and work. And that, you know, if we are a museum of uh, American art and a museum of record, we have a very special responsibility to the artists of this country. And, you know, there's a, one institution and thank God there are other institutions that focus on these things, but I, 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 I do feel a very special responsibility to, um, you know, own up to the things um, we can do better and, uh, and, and, um, and to keep moving forward. And Julie Maritou show, which we co-organized with um, Los Angeles County, Museum, Rue Hockley did the show, extraordinary um, exhibition. Um, uh, and one of the things I'm always proud of is the way artists themselves have collaborated in doing their own exhibitions. We take that for granted today, but 30 years ago, very few institutions ever let the artists in the gallery for the most part until the show was already determined. And going back to Marsha Tucker's first um, great Richard Tuttle show, when the Whitney was um, was trounced in the press, and and Marsha Tucker in part left over that was you know because God forbid that the artist was invited to actually participate in the selection, the making, and actually changing works in the galleries. Today we take that all for granted, but the Whitney has always believed that artists were their partners in in, in the process, and. Um, uh, you know, and that, that's happening right now with the Jasper John show. I mean, uh, uh, Carlos Boswaldo from the Philadelphia Museum and Scott Rothkoff are curating the show together. Um, Jasper prefers not to comment too much and get too involved, but he surely had the opportunities if he had wanted to. Wait, before we move on though, quickly, yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, it goes to, I think the idea of collaboration, not only with Black Mud, no, but with the, with the artist is very important. And for two reasons, one is, I know the show originated at LACMA. I'm talking about the Julie Moretu show, if we can go back one. Yeah. Um, but I cannot, I cannot imagine, Adam, the show looking any better than it looked at the Whitney. Just wow. the wall mm -hmm. space, the sight lines, and the way it's laid out with the views of the river, it's just amazing. So wow. important work. Uh, mid-career survey. Our designer, of Melanie, is amazing. And I, you know, mm -hmm. the, the Whitney works as a team and a team effort. Our, our, our art handlers are, are brilliant. Our architecture team is amazing. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, a collect, it's, a, it's a collective activity realizing this. And everybody is involved in every exhibition in one way or another. And I hope that's the way they feel. They should all take great pride. You know, I mean, the David Hammonds, which you mentioned, which we can, I think we have some images there and Nick can pull one up, but yeah. um, you know, what, I, what I'm, you know, particularly proud about this project is this, we did not go to David Hammonds. David Hammonds came to us and he came to us with this kind of folly of an idea. You know, we had always hoped and we thought it would be wonderful to have something art in the Gansvore Peninsula across the way, but we didn't want to create another sculpture garden. That's not what we think the world needs in New York anyway. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I wasn't, I wasn't anxious to actually commission an artist because it's a very risky venture to commission something. And, um, but this, was, this piece, which is called Day's End, which is based on the original pier shed that was on the site. It's in the exact place and the exact dimensions. And it echoes exactly the artist Gordon Mata Clark's, um, uh, his piece that was there. And actually David Hammonds came to us uh, with a little sketch and um, and actually he refers to this as much as Gordon Mata Clark's piece as his own. He feels that this was a colla his collaboration with history, his collaboration with our engineer, Guillermo Nordenson, his collaboration with the Whitney. And um, what I love about this piece is that it is there permanently, but the Whitney doesn't own it, even though the Whitney raised all the money for it. And it is, um, we will take care of it in per 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 perpetuity and it is on city land. So we feel that, you know, this is great. This is a front door and it's not about ownership. It's about, um, and to me, it's a great metaphor for openness and, and, and possibility. And the idea that you have to, you know, fill in the, uh, fill in the line, so to speak, in your own imagination. And it's constantly changing. This is a private story, Adam. I, um, I want to say something about uh, having worked with the, uh, the great David uh, Hammonds and I had the privilege, if that could be called one, at MoMA of inviting him to, of giving him a, a, a solo show. And obviously, you know that he flatly refused. I'm assuming that you are the first institution in New York City, the first museum with which he has collaborated to, to this uh, degree, or am I wrong? 
Has he had a, well, another? He, he did a very nice collaboration um, uh, with MoMA, I have to say. Um, I with, with this, you know, with and nothing on this scale, I would say, and nothing. I mean, this was a five year collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're right, nothing on the scale, Joachim, but he, you know, he did um, the drawing show that, that was brilliant that was at the drawing center recently was not technically a collaboration, but David was contributing drawings throughout the whole process of the show. And Maura Hopman so brilliantly um, indicated every time he brought in new works, she would date it on the label, which the additions he was making. So it, um, uh, I think, you know, David is encouraged to kind of openness and a rethinking of institutions. And, yeah. um, it, I absolutely yeah. love the piece that you're, uh, that you worked on with him. I mean, that he worked with you and this Thank is you. fantastic what you're describing. <laughs> it reminds me, I just want to throw that in, uh, an, an artist, uh, uh, African artist, Wange Chimutu, who did for the for the uh, the first biennial in New Orleans right after Katrina uh, flood? She just did this this very dramatic in the the ninth uh, zone, the ninth wall, which was as you know the, the one mostly populated by African Americans, ninety percent decimated, completely okay. empty, and it was sort of desert wasteland. And she just did those this structure of a shed or a, a cabin just with those pillars vertical and it was absolutely magical and yeah, frightening. I remember it. I remember, you remember that. There's a, I don't know whether there's an echo that David would, uh, next time I see him, I, I will ask him about it. It is very interesting. Yeah. He never really, he never really, the only, the only one he really acknowledges in this one is Gordon Mata Clark, which is kind of, yes. but you know, I, just, there, there was one particularly magic moment when we first decided that we were going to do it. We, we rented a little boat to go out to see the sight from the water and we invited Jane Crawford, who was Gordon's widow. Um, and, um, and she with her daughter or head of the Gordon Mata Clark Foundation and David, who was very shy and Jane are very shy. They walked up to each other and they hugged each other. They embraced, and it was a magic. This was, you know, it, this was yeah, yeah, yeah. only six months, nine months into the project, and nobody knew for sure. But there was this moment of recognition, this moment of, uh, and um, you know, and it was really, really touching to me. It's, um, you know, mm -hmm. the ephemeral made made long term. Oh, beautiful. So we're beautiful. it is incredible to hear um, those personal about those personal uh, connections. Shall we move on? Because I, for one, am dying to hear about this exciting collaboration on Jasper Johns that you've got coming up very soon, next week, I think. Yes, we have. Well, we. Um, I think it. I think we open on the twenty-first. I guess it is next week. Um, or we. Uh, and um, they are installing right now. I have to say, um, it's it's quite amazing. I mean, what's amazing about it is it it is a an exhibition in, in two parts that are simultaneous. One part is Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Art Museum. Um, uh, the other is at the Whitney Museum. And it's probably the first time in a way of a, of a museum exhibition. There are multi-site shows that we've seen, but this is an exhibition which really, in the whole notion of the show is, as you can see from the title, it's called Mind Mirror. It's the idea of, of mirroring and doubling, which you can see from the double American flags in here. You know, so much of um, uh, uh, Jasper's work is about this notion of doubling and about um, mirroring and, you know, the sort of divided self. And actually, I love that. This is the opening wall, which is a mini retrospective of, uh, of kind of 30 prints. And actually, I love the way that even the way they're hung, there's a, a horizon line. It looks like they're doubled. They're kind of reflecting each other in a way. Um, beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful installation. But um, you know, uh, you know, there are four institutions in the U.S. in particular that that um, Jasper has had very close relationships with: the Museum of Modern Art, which did a retrospective twenty something years ago, the National Gallery, which has done a lot with Jasper, including the um, uh, the Meyerhoff collection, which featured a lot of, and the other two are the Philadelphia Museum, which was the uh, presented him at the Venice Biennale, and the Whitney, which did an early retrospective of his, and. Um, and, and the Whitney in Philadelphia had, had you know, are really honored. Um, it was Jasper's 90th birthday it was supposed to be a 90th birthday exhibition. It's now a 91st um, birthday exhibition, but um, uh, as, as the National Gallery and MoMA had relatively recent opportunities, Jasper is, to, who is an artist who's meant both so much to our institutions. And um, 
you know, and this will be the largest, most comprehensive, but it's not just that it's large and comprehensive. This is an artist who has worked in prints and in drawings and in object making. And this is a way of really showing the complexity of the work. You could see the show um, just in Philadelphia, you could see it just in New York, or you could see both. Um, you know, you'll feel like you've seen it both times um, and you, you will feel a sense of deja vu as uh, Yogi Berra, the famous coach would say, you get deja vu all over again. But, um, uh, um, uh, it, you know, I think it, it's, it's a great way to mark um, this great figure in American art who, um, uh, you know, who, who is who, uh, very complex, very mysterious, yet um, so well known in many ways. And, you know, and, and, and you know, and an artist, um, uh, you know, an artist who was gay and, and, and it is very much, you know, reflected, but very subtly and complexly in, in his work. Um, and I, I think this will be a surprising show for those people who um, think they know the work and for those who um, don't know the work, what a way to um, enter into it. Um, you know, there are a whole generation of young people who have never seen this much work together. And it's unlikely the works are coming from Japan and Europe and um, all over the world. And I think it's highly unlikely that these works will ever be together um, again, at least in the next decade. So um, I think it'll be a very special show. And we have a wonderful Jennifer Packer show, which we are taking from the Serpentine, a great painter, young painter who was in the last biennial, um, uh, primarily portrait painter. Um, you know, she, she's, I think, an extraordinarily talented, um, artist who takes from so many different traditions and ways of working and, and um, incredible formal and coloristic innovation. The portraits are, are rich and, 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 and veiled and, um, you know, and, and they, both, they reveal slowly. They are, they're, 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 they're both beautiful and spectacular, but slow burns as I mean, and that's what I think port, great portraiture is about. And, um, a young artist who, um, I mean, if this is what she's doing in her 30s, to just imagine what she'll do 20 years from now. Um, so this is another, we had the biennial coming up, as I mentioned, the 2022. So the biennial, but before we talk about just the last bits, I just want to make sure everyone knew that the Dawood Bay is still oh, on right. show and now. I know, and I'm doing a talk with Dawood tomorrow. Um, so I, I definitely have, Dawood is an artist too. The Whitney has had a really, um, has had a long relationship with. He's been in a couple of biennials. We've collected his work for a long time. This is a kind of a selected survey of key thematic bodies of works. This is from um, um, uh, his class pictures exhibition. Dowit is doing some of the best work of his entire life. Um, uh, somebody who has documented and presented and uh, on the black community for many years, both in New York, Chicago, and around the US, whose work has gotten, is now starting to work in video and um, more in installation and somebody who was known primarily for portraits, but I is, is doing what I think of as portraits and sentia, um, which are these incredible landscapes like his new show. He actually has a new show as well with Sean Kelly Gallery and give him a little plug, which has, um, uh, his great installation. So I hope that you'll see that a new install um, a video piece that he did. Um, so that's that's still up for another um, few weeks. So we're thrilled. And let's see, what else do we have up there? Thank you for reminding me. We no, have so much going great. on. And then I it's think, yes, we have my, and I think, and um, My Barbarian, which are, are, are um, a trio of performance artists, Molly Gaines, Jade Gordon, and, Ale and, and Alejandro Sagade. Um, they've been performing for uh, 20 years. This is a 20 year retrospective organized by um, Adrian Edwards of performances and brand new commission um, that is uh, uh, being done. Um, and that'll be happening this fall as well. So um, lots to see, lots to do, lots to be inspired by. So I'm just struck by how the history of the Whitney hasn't changed very much. Um, the original ideas behind it um, have been uh, modified to, uh, as you say, to be flexible, to reflect the times and the now, the current events of now. But in terms of uh, broadening and expanding, you've done some amazing things in making all the shows more diverse, mo the multiplicity of uh, medium, mm -hmm. um, but the intent and the original core focus seems kind of pretty much there, you can so, sort of trace the threads of, of the history of America through the, 
the shows of the Whitney um, yeah, and, I mean, and I always protest. I, mean, I, and, I feel like as, as long as the Whitney stays close to the artists and the artist community, um, but at the same time also understands that it's not just a single artist community, they're multiple artist communities and that we always have to enlarge our own view of the world um, and, and the artists who are out there working and it's always um, pushing ourselves. Um, and we use artists as models, uh, you know, the artists push themselves to do more and to push harder. And that's, that's the way um, I hope, I think the best way for us to work as well is to push hard, um, admit what we uh, don't know, um, learn, grow, and change. Um, but before we let you go, one quick question about the Frick Madison or the Breuer building that some of us still remember the Whitney very much, uh, very clearly in our memories. Um, I think I could be wrong and please forgive me, but that it's a Whitney space. And um, yes, after- The Whitney owns it. We've leased it, you know, it's, it's a, a, a lease um, collaboration. Uh, with the Metropolitan Museum and also, um, and now the Met has, um, has uh, subtenanted to the Frick and the Frick will be there um, at least through fall of 23 and maybe somewhat beyond. Um, and we have, you know, we, we, we have some ideas of, but, we, but no decisions have been made about, um, about what's next. And, um, uh, it's a you know wonderful iconic building in a landmark district. It's um, something a building we cherish and a history that we cherish. And um, um, and um, uh, stay tuned for the next chapter. As soon as we know, we'll let you know. <laughs> so it could be a possible satellite uh, location, maybe, we, perhaps. We, we really just don't even know yet. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, there are a lot of ideas on the table, and 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 at this point. Um, you know, it's it's in it's in it's in the discussion phase. We, you know, um, and, you know, we're we're brain we're brain we're brainstorming. We got a few years to go. Uh, take it one step at a time, Joakim. Are you um, ready to go to questions, Nick? Are we ready to have oh, yes. uh, our audience I, come through? I want I want to say, Adam, this was really an illuminating. Um, breezing through the history of the Whitney, history of America in a way, and, and your curatorship uh, at the helm of, the, of this institution. I see Judith Bernstein who agrees, to, so <laughs> thumbs up. I, I really, phenomenal, congrats and, and no, kudos no, to you. Thank, uh, thank, thank you both, you, um, your, your questions were good and um, you, know, you get right to the heart of the matter pretty, pretty, pretty fast, which is good, thank you. Great. So I I'm hoping that we will have some time to uh, address some of the questions that have come through the chat. Um, take it away, Nick. Is it Nick or Anya? I, I'm confused. Oh. Is it Anya? Oh. Sorry. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be moderating uh, the Q&A a bit. Um, thank you so much for this conversation, Helen, Joachim, and Adam. Um, Adam, you're an incredible storyteller. So I was just captured by this. I was just warming up. <laughs> I could tell. Charles is laughing. He knows. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have some really wonderful questions, and our first one comes from GE Schwartz. Um, and so I'm going to pass you the microphone. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, and 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 congratulations to everyone, especially Adam, who look, looks like a wonderful season up ahead. I can't wait to get there. And thinking about all the years of essential shows that, that I've seen and that have also at times been flashpoints, especially those glorious biennials at the Whitney, um, especially as, as, as redemptive aesthetics ask us a lot of times as a corrective to life, doesn't the Whitney affirm the corrective virtue of works of art, often um, depending on the, on the misreading of art? I'm not quite clear exactly what 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 the question is. If you could just refine a little bit, I just okay, I, sure. I, basically, yeah. I, in the in the end, you know, I mean, we're always, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people believe art should be nice and set out and well, you know, managed and write a nice little box tied up with pink ribbon and all that. Mm -hmm. But in the end, 
the, the best pieces that have had that have been there and the flashpoints that have happened there and all the wonderful other things that have happened, which have created a lot of wonderful discussions on all levels, seem to be the ones where people have misread them a little bit. Yeah, I, I don't know about misreading per se, but I would say, I would say, and I, I now think I know where you're going with it. I right. think that, you know, because we're, ex, you know, when we're presenting, particularly, you know, the works of young art, or not even young artists, you know, new artists, um, whatever their age, um, uh, or, you know, and, and it happens obviously a lot in biennials because that's the largest number, but, um, you know, in its time, you know, you know, what I love about works of art is they change. They change before our eyes. They change before our time, you know, in, our, in time. And I think a lot of times when we see them, we, we don't fully understand them. And, um, you know, I think it was Robert Rosenblum, um, uh, you know, who, who famously said, when I, when I see a work of art, I like it. It's probably not very interesting. If I dislike it, it's probably interesting. And if I hate it, it's probably great. You know, I mean, it's a bit of a paraphrase, but I think that it, and, and I think, I think, you know, really the point he's making is sort of the point that you're making is that there are a lot of things that we don't understand that, you know, and, and often misread because it is in, in sort of real time and it's only over time, you know, I, you know, again, I don't know why I'm thinking of Gustin this morning, but I think of, you know, Gustin. Oh, I was, yeah. But, you know, with, is, is, you know, if I think of like Gustin's later paintings, you know, people thought in, originally that all of his more kind of, you know, figurative paintings were kind of crappy, you know, and, and when they first came out, he was like derided for, you know, ab abandoning abstraction. And now some, I think there's some of the most powerful American paintings ever made, you know, so it's, uh, you know, um, it takes us time to catch up. And I, you know, and I have to say, you know, I, I had a great mentor in my life. I was very lucky. I had a man named Martin Friedman, who was director of Walker Art Center. And I, many years ago, I remember talking about stories. I'll give you a story. And that is that um, uh, I was a young curator in my 20s and I brought him the work of, uh, of Keith Haring. And I asked, I wanted to do a Keith Haring um, mural project. And, uh, and he looked at it and he just kind of wrinkled up his nose and he was thinking, and I, <laughs> And I said, and I said to Martin, you're such an old fart. I can't believe it. I mean, Keith Haring's fantastic. And he just said to me, you too will become the victim of your generation. And, um, and you know, so the, it's, it's true. We all become to a degree, the victim of our generations. We, we identify with a generation older, a couple of years, you know, a bit, maybe one or two younger if we're lucky, but you know, there's a lot I don't understand. And, you know, I have to say, people are always relieved when I'm talking to groups of people in the biennial and I say, you know, this is a really interesting show, a challenging show. I don't like everything. I don't understand everything, but that's not the point. If I understood it all and liked it all, what would be the reason for doing it, you know? Um, I like that there are younger curators who are challenging me and different curators who are challenging me. Um, you know, people like what's comfortable, but after a while, comfortable ain't so good, you know? It gets pretty <laughs> uncomfortable to be too comfortable. <laughs> So I don't know if that answers your question. But oh, no, thank you so much. I got my tickets for October 4th. See you then. Terrific. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thank you, GD. Um, the next question we have comes from Martha Wilson. And a very own Martha. Nick. Hi, Martha. Hey, Martha, let's see. Martha, are you available? She might not be there, but anyway. Yeah, yeah I think um, I'm, I'm here. here. Hi, I'm Martha. Here. Right. Um, so I wanted Adam to tell the story of how the conservation lab, which was, as I understand it, going to be in the basement, uh, and the services of the whole building were moved as a result of Hurricane Sandy. Well, actually, none of those were not the result of Hurricane Sandy, Martha. <laughs> we're not. For, first of all, I just, you know, um, I just want to say, um, Martha is an extraordinary artist and an extraordinary arts leader. And I just want to pay tribute to her for just a second to just say how much I, first of all, I'm honored you're on today, Martha, but I just such an admirer of yours. You're, you know, an extraordinary, extraordinary human being and extraordinary. I, I have loved you ever since I saw you at the Women's Thank March. Thank you. Well, wow. but anyway, um, we didn't actually, um, the, con the conservation lab um, was always supposed to be upstairs. Um, uh, that would have been a real mistake putting it down in the basement anyway. But, um, but you know, so I think one of the things I, and, and, I, and I discussed this with Renzo early on, is I said, you know, 
the Breuer building, th something like two thirds of the office of the Breuer building didn't have windows. It was really pretty awful for mm -hmm. people. And I said, you know, I would really like to make it so that the great majority of our staff members have at least natural light, if not actually next to a window. And they don't all today, but we, you know, are actually, I would argue that um, our best spaces uh, today, among the very best spaces are where our art handlers are. The art handlers, <laughs> art handlers are on the fifth floor next to our largest gallery. And I'll never, I'll never forget, I was in the first days when we walked into the into the new museum, I was walking in with one of our art handlers and he said, he said, you know, I'm gonna miss our clubhouse in the basement. We had this old funky table and everybody used to love hanging out there. And he went on and on about, you know, it's not gonna be the same. We're gonna have this, you know, in different place. And so I bring him up into his new office. I open the doors and he had this incredible 180 degree view of the Hudson River. He turns to me and he said, Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that, you know, we still have our carpentry shop below grade. We still have, um, you know, our, uh, some of the security space, obviously, Bagrobe, but, you know, the great majority of people are, are, are upstairs and we wanted everything upstairs. And we were very fortunate because um, uh, there, none of the art is, um, is stored or, or accessible below grade. We have a state of the art flood control system. The only art um, that we have on, on, on the ground level is, uh, uh, is in our lobby gallery and what's in the lobby, which can be moved at a moment's notice. And we put in, after Hurricane Sandy, we put in, we put in a special system that was devised for the Whitney, that, um, that flood, flood um, wall that goes 16 feet high around the entire museum. So I remember Robin Pogerman said to me when she was, um, when we were telling her about it, she said, well, what happens when the water's over 16 feet? And I said, Robin, New York is in much deeper trouble than the Whitney Museum being, you know, the water being, if it's over 16 feet, there ain't gonna be New York City anymore. But I have to tell you, the Whitney is where you wanna come. It's the Noah's Ark if, uh, if, okay. there's, a, if there's a flood okay. in New York. So reserve your place now. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Martha, and thank you, Adam. Um, the next question, actually, um, I, I have a question for you. And I, I, I've been thinking a lot about Day's End, and I'm really glad um, you were, um, you touched on, on who, talking about uh, David Hammonds and his work with the Whitney. Um, and it just, I just, I was thinking about that in, in um, the context of what you were saying about protests in the institution. Um, when you said, if you are about the art of the day, of your day, you are involved indirectly in the issues of the day, um, in terms of, you know, the role of, of the museum and of museum director. So considering that, I, I was just thinking of how, you know, Hammond's protested the, the 93 biennial, um, I, I believe it was 93, and now he comes to the Whitney with the idea for Day's End in homage to Gordon Mata Clark. Um, and I was thinking about those two things um, in relation to one another, you know, Hammond stood outside of the Whitney then, and now he places this kind of skeleton of a building outside of the Whitney, where it is at once part of it and outside of it, and uh, it's not a private piece, but a public piece. And I just wanted to ask you how you contend with that push and pull, you know, we're speaking about protests and then the inevitable um, inclusion um, that comes after protests. But how do you how do you contend with well, potential limits? I, I, I don't remember that David protested the ninety three biennial. I can't remember what I I I I actually think he was included in the biennial if I remember correctly, and and I could be. This is what happens when you've been around <laughs> too long. That thirty it's it's thirty years ago now. But my recollection is he was in the ninety three biennial. I'm sure there were times where David was not included, though. To your point, um, Anya. Um, and um, you know, it's it it it's it, you know. I think in, the, in my mind, look, it's always a reminder of how um, you know that no matter how inclusive we are, um, you know, there will always be people who we are leaving out. And 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 what you'd have to do is have a really healthy sense of of self doubt to understand that you know um, uh, you know that. You know, the, the, the notion of, of any canon is sort of a fake notion in a way, and that, you know, that, that it, it, it's, not, it's not a set and fixed kind of thing. And um, I mean, I feel fortunate because the Whitney, I think, has been more responsive than many institutions in that regard. And, um, 
Um, but yes, it, you know, it's always, it will always, you know, it'll always be, it'll always be the case. And it's funny, it makes me think again, yet another story, but you know, John Sloan, who was, you know, a, a, a you know, a, a, you know, a, a, an artist from the turn of the century, best known for the turn of the century, was a socialist. And um, he was an artist who Mrs. Whitney, who was the richest woman in America supported. And he always thought she, you know, for the longest time that she was a real dilettante and, you know, and he, you know, this rich woman who was, you know, showing his work. And I, I remember he wrote a statement in her memorial exhibition, basically acknowledging that, you know, there was a lot more going on than, she, than he ever realized. And that what she did, she really proved to all of us that she was more open-minded than she was. And I think that, um, you know, I think that that's not to say that, you know, we all are, but, um, you know, I think we have to strive to um, be open-minded and look at those kinds of things and not just, it's not, it's not about being authorities per se. That doesn't mean that we don't know a lot and look a lot, think a lot. And I think our, our decisions hopefully are very informed and, and based on a lot of reflection, but it'll always be imperfect. That example, John Sloan, um, it's an excellent uh, way of thinking about the complexities of, of you know, working with institutions. So I appreciate that. Um, our next question comes from our very own Malvika. Thank you, Anya. Um, Anya, we don't hear you very well. At least I, I don't on my end. Maybe oh, you're. Sorry. So the, I don't know if the mic is uh, too far from you. Just. That's possible. Um, can you hear me? A little yeah, better, yes. yeah. Okay. I think Perfection. so. Thank you. Thank you. To hear Anya is a blessing and um, uh, should be treated like a rare commodity as well. Um, I wanted to thank you, Adam, for this beautiful conversation. You're such a fantastic orator. Um, and it's really been a pleasure. Um, so many of your comments, especially about sort of the literal expansion of what constitutes an American artist, were really meaningful to me personally. And when you mentioned the question of Kind of the discourse around removing American from the name of the museum. Uh, Joachim and Helen, I was like suddenly reminded of a conversation which both of you were on uh, exactly this week in 2020 with Laurence de Cars, uh, the French mm -hmm. curator who was tapped to be director of the Louvre and then like worked uh, at the Musée d'Orsay before that, and who came onto the Zoom and said quite plainly about sort of, you know, what is a French museum? And I remember she said, um, she said the French approach to a museum is a very political one inherently because it is a public institution and because inside of any national museum in France you have the whole history of what it means of what is a museum inside of a society and this idea of curators as civil servants etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and that you know is obviously a, a little bit different from how the Whitney private museums are national culture of civil servants function but um, something about the American Museum, the French Museum. And also it feels like so much of this rubs up against the fact that, you know, even here stateside, so many of our museums are kind of also a nice way of shoring up national identity or like a national myth. And then I feel like we've we've seen, um, you know, on the forefront of everyone's minds over the past year or so, as we watch kind of different museums like reconcile with uh, transitional moments and tremors, it, you know, it feels like a lot of that is just the museum recalibrating to how the institution relates to the community, exactly what you were saying, like, who are you in service to, who are the people, uh, what is the directionality, things like that. Um, you know, you spoke about sort of American citizenry, the role of American artists, and I, I really like thinking of that as like a porous thing. I guess, um, I guess my question, not to put words in your mouth, my question is that while you were speaking, I was seeing a kind of expansion rather than like a contraction and also what felt like perhaps a, a push towards an alternative model or like new social relations that you're imagining within the space of the Whitney or the museum as an idea. Um, and I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that, like what personally, um, you know, what is the role of the museum in the world, um, you know, the cultural institution mm -hmm. in the world? Like, mm -hmm. how does that function for you? Well, I think, you know, I think it, and maybe I can, you know, I'll, I'll sort, of, sort of go back to Flora Biddle's statement that Whitney Museum is an idea, not a building. And, you know, it's ironic because, you know, you know, here I spent so many years working on this new building, which I feel really great about. But, um, you know, I, I, but I do think it is, it, it is an idea in that way. And it's how do you make, 
and 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 the physical which is you know in, like an art object is a physical thing what you know what what is the experience or the experiences that physical things call out to you and cause you to affect you and affect you in both in, in both ways and um you know and it and it isn't it it you know it starts with a physical thing and I, this is kind of an obtuse way of kind of answering your question but um you know i'm just thinking i you know so this wonderful saison drawing show at the modern this weekend before it closed you know extraordinary my favorite um uh, drawings and watercolors were the ones that um have have the most white space in them and the most empty space in them and and, and um you know just the sense of absence and how you fill things in and it, and, and i think you know i think i think um you know, I think institutions serve that function of creating space and spaces for people to fill things in and for people to carry memories with them. And it's one of the things I like about the, a lot about the um, David Hammond's piece is it's, 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 you know, most people think it's an unfinished building and they think that it, and, and I, I love that it feels that unfinishedness and, you know, and symbolically what, what I see, you know, what I love is that, you know, you walk out the front door of the Whitney and you see the Hammonds and, and it creates a kind of town square, so to speak. I mean, it, with a building that isn't even there and a park that will be there. So it creates a space in the park between, the spaces between. And, you know, and I and I really feel that, you know, and, and you know, that when you, art doesn't begin when you walk into the Whitney and it doesn't end when you leave the Whitney. And that's what the Hammonds was about. We're now working on a, long-term collaboration with uh, the Roy Lichtenstein Foundation, which is just four blocks from the Whitney uh, program that we're looking at that hopefully will connect with the Whitney Independent Study Program and, um, and residencies and programs. It's like, you know, how do you create spaces in between and different kinds of spaces and opportunities? That's, that's, what it's, that's what it's really about. And, you know, I mean, come back and do a little pitch for the rail. I mean, I think that's one of the things the rail's done really well. It's opened up spaces, spaces for different kinds of discussions and communications and exhibitions and programs. It's, it's about open, opening it up. And, um, um, and I think that as long as there's space, like those, you know, Cezans on the wall, to, enter into it and that you leave it open um then there's then 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 there's hope as soon as you shut down you're in trouble you know and i it, it, you know it's a very large way of saying it. it's really more metaphorical but i i i think it's about space and in, in, in every sense of the word i really like uh, that thank you thank you for the question that was an excellent expansive question as people are noting in the chat so thank you um, we're about to close the Q&A and our final um, question will come from our very own Fong Bui, our publisher. So um, turn it to you. Look like there's one last question from Fatma. Yep. Thank you, thank you, uh, Adam, that was amazing. Uh, Joachim, Helen, doing an amazing job as moderator as always. Uh, I, I wanted to plug in the show that I remember seeing at Yale. It just because Daoun was mentioned, the show that was, I think it might be 98, Joachim, that you did with Tom Crow, that included mm -hmm. also Craig, J. Gregory Coulson and John Curran and Anne Hamilton. So you make just so you you exist as a serious curator too. <laughs> he exists as more than a serious curator. <laughs> you know, we tend he's, to he's one of one of the great art historical minds working today, and also one That's of the right. nicest people, one of the menchiest people I know. <laughs> yes, Adam, thank you for for mentioning that. And what just bring to mind the, to Anya's point earlier is ninety three is really known for my dear friend Daniel Rosic Martinez. The, the museum tag, I can't imagine ever wanting to be white. <laughs> so that's what of the show. And, and which was mentioned when Julie Maritou came for lunch just before the pandemic in February. And she said that it was through Daniel that she learned about the Tour of the Rail around 2001. So it's kind of remarkable as a testament to you, Adam, because I know that you were super generous when our beloved dear friend, uh, the great art historian Urban Sandler passed away. Um, not only when you hosted 
when the real audition host published his last memoir at the Whitney, you also organized on the fly, last minute, helping Lucy. And it was turned out to be the, one of the biggest memorial I ever attended. It's mm. easily 2,000 people showed up and it is filled the entire lobby, then mm. in room only, mm. which, which in a way evoked the sense what I learned so much from Irvin, because you mentioned already Martin Freeman, like we all need a mentor in life. And the, what we learned from Urban is the idea on the spot history. Mm -hmm. You would never understand the artist until you spend time in his, her, mm -hmm. or their studio. It's an amazing skill that I believe that you have a little bit more pronouncedly than on other friends who, uh, who we know, among people we know. We won't name names. But the point is that the, every artist I know of adore you because you take time to spend to visit their studio. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you do that because I know it's very hard for me. If I don't do anything else, that's what I would do. Spend time in the other studio. So where do you learn that uh, stamina? Because, you know, it's just a very specific skill, you know, Adam. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, I mean, Look, it's the greatest joy of my life, and um, uh, you know, to visit to, to visit our studios. I wish I had more time to do it, but um, Judith Judith knows who I see there. Who I, who I try to visit at least once a year, and we have a we have a wonderful time together. But you know, I, I remember actually. I'll end with one last story because I always have endless stories, and that is, um, I remember um, um, it must have been about twenty five years ago in Berlin, and um, I was at a small dinner. And I, um, I think it was at the Thomas Schutte Gallery for Gordon Mata Clark. Um, uh, and I was seated um, uh, uh, next to Kiniston McShine, um, you know, the great MoMA curator. Um, I think the, you know, the second black curator in the history of the institution after Howardina Pindell. And, um, Pindell. and um, I remember um, Kiniston asking me, he said, he said, so what are you doing here in Berlin? Well, I'm you know, here to see shows, but I'm also here to make studio visits. And, 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 um, and he said, studio visits? Why do you want to make studio visits? It only clouds your vision. It makes you prejudice <laughs> to, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and, you know, and I went on and on about how, how, important, how, how important I thought it was. And he kind of, you know, and, and, and Kiniston who never really smiled much, but, you know, was always challenging and he was a great curator. And I, and I said, really, you don't make studio visits? He said, no, I don't like to make studio visits. It clouds my vision. And the next day I was telling the story to somebody else and they said, oh, that's funny. Um, I hear the Kiniston made three studio visits here in Berlin. So, <laughs> et voila. <laughs> so, good curators are good liars too, I guess. <laughs> He probably just didn't want me to know which ones I was going to. <laughs> he was going to that. that was anyway, fun. thank you so much um, for hosting this. This was wonderful. Enjoy it. Thank you so much. My now, great pleasure. Coming away thinking about that remark and very Machiavellian indeed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I learned from him too. Thank Good you. teachers thank all. You, thank you. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Helen. And thank you, Thank you, and thank, th thank you Nate, and Anya. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Anya. Thank and you, Laura. Uh, thank you, Laura Busby. Thank you. Um, and at the rail, we have a tradition of, of closing. Oh, up. right, right. I, the benediction. Yeah. I was looking forward to my benediction. <laughs> Yeah, we, we close out our events with a, a poetry reading. It's something that we've, we've always done and we've carried them into these Zoom events. And today we're thrilled to welcome um, our poet laureate, Ty Cooper, um, to the stage. A graduate from Pratt Institute, writer Ty Cooper works in experimental prose, poetry, and digital language art. They are currently a production and events assistant at the Brooklyn Rail. So, yeah. Ty. Thank you, Ty. Thank you, Anya, and thank you, Adam and Joachim and Helen for today's amazing conversation. It's really been so lovely to hear you all talk. 
Um, today I'm reading two pieces which are in conversation with each other, both of which are quite new. Uh, the first is, is straight from my notebook and uh, provides a framework for the second, which was written in collaboration between myself and an open source AI called GPT-2. So these are some ruminations on the world and the self from, from me and my robot friends. I am a daughter who breathes so the world can breathe, a mountain with a crick in its neck. I sit on blue below gray and feel my bones push their weight into texture which will print itself on my skin. I read a Bible as it was written by James Baldwin and want to turn myself upside down so that my lips will come unglued and my eyes. My feet are painted red and don't match the vision of them which I hold in my mind. I write this essay on the right side of the page and feel the weight of the absence of holy ritual in the lower half of my spine. I feel the end of the world in the wind that blows through the garbage bag covered windows next to me and in the white gray silence of a morning too still and too old. The damp of the blanket touches my shorts as I attempt to begin these words before the pen touches my hand where it now cramps. I feel I should be writing forever or not at all and my bones resist. And now the piece written in collaboration with my robot. <laughs> I found my way up a mountain and camped out. I climb a mountain and stay there for over an hour. My eyes water from the red mountains, the dewy moon. My skin is like parchment, but better. I return to the phone and continue. I have been collecting moths from beneath my sheets and depositing them in plastic Ziploc bags all over the floor. There is something about the smooth texture of the earth and the way the air we exhale is pushed out over land, pushed back in, that feels like a return. I predict that the moths will return when the house is empty and I will be gone. I am wrong, and the earth is home to more than I can count. Is there anyone who has not been influenced by the way that one's existence is constructed, constructed, constructed? I am thinking of the way that I look at all things early in my career. The first time I viewed a sunset without a lens. The first time I listened to a single song without an instrument. The first time I felt the weight of a full calendar day without the aid of a calendar. I have been collecting leaves from under my rocks and depositing them in plastic Ziploc bags across the floor. There is something about the dark and the precision with which they move that attracts me. I predict that the leaves will rot when the house is empty and I will be gone. I am also ending and coming soon after. How do I put this lyrically again? I am collecting myself from the pages of a children's book and placing them in plastic Ziploc bags. I'm trying out new names for the things I'm putting in the plastic bag and the world is my puzzle piece. I did not grow up wanting to pick up children, much less play with them. My earliest memories are of sitting quietly by my auntie's bed, crying over a sport I did not particularly care for. I have been collecting myself from the sides of the plane and placing them on the windowsills. I know that there is water on the windowsills, but I leave it there so that it can run down and stick itself to my neck. It seems to like it that way. I bet you wish you could go back in time and say something like this. I bet you wish you could touch those things that your grandma didn't make. I bet you wish you could pull those pictures out of your grandmother's folder and shove them away like you always have. And I know what you are thinking. What does it even mean to be? I am a hybrid because I am constantly on the move. Constantly on the move because the world is. I am a hybrid because I have two hearts, one inside me, the other inside of my chest, and I can feel them arguing. I am a hybrid because I have a spine that can never quite meet its end and a bicep that never quite got the memo. I am a daughter born so that the world can have a daughter. I am a daughter who lives so that the world can breathe. I am a daughter who breathes so that the world can breathe. End of text. Please enable JavaScript to watch this video. My goodness. Thank you so much, Ty. What an honor to hear your recent work. Um, I'm just yep. beaming after listening to that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ty. What a wonderful way to end. Thank and you. Thank you so beautiful. much. Thank you all of you for being part of this conversation. Conversation, excuse me. 
Thank you, Joaquin, Helen, Adam. This has been truly marvelous. Um, and join us tomorrow for uh, another conversation at 1 p.m. between Guy Goodwin, David Reed, and Charlotte Kent. And that will conclude with a poetry reading from Andrea Adi-Aram. I'm sure there will be another um, fabulous conversation. Um, and now I invite all of you to turn on your microphones and um, say thank you and goodbye as well. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Ellen. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Ty. Thank you, that was Adam. so much fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank